you're planning to keep bees in an area that has bear activity, you really should look into getting an electric fence to protect your beehives. Hi, I'm Jim from Beekeeping for Newbies, and I'm going to talk to you about the electric fence we recently put up and our experience with bears in our area here in the Hudson Valley in New York State. We got our first hive six years ago, set it up, very happy to have it, and not long after we got it, I came out one morning and it had been completely tipped over, all the frames were all over the place, it had been hit by a bear. I was able to find the bees, they were all congregated somewhere in the grass, so I was able to get it back together, tie it down with ratchet straps while I figured out what to do next. The bear came back, knocked it over again, the straps held it together, but along the way we lost our queen and the hive eventually dissipated with no new brood. We were newbies at the time, didn't understand what was going on in the hive. So we lost an entire year, not to mention the cost of the bees. I think those bees set us back about somewhere around $135, $150. So that was no fun either. The following year, we got new bees. We got a what I thought was going to be a temporary electric fence situation. It was a Gallagher, uh, spelled Gallagher, Gallagher in New Zealand, I guess, uh, smart fence, which was an all-in-one solution. We set that up, and we have not had a bear problem since. But it's been long overdue to replace that with a permanent fence, so we set up what I've got here behind me. Let me walk you through how an electric fence works first, and then we'll get into the process we went through to set up ours. This is our fence charger, also called an energizer. This is what feeds an electrical current through the wires. Um, this is a Gallagher S40. To be honest, it's a little undersized for bear deterrence. Um, when you're looking at an energizer to deter bears, there are two criteria you should really look at. One is the stored power, which is stated in the number of joules. It's recommended that you have at least 0 0.7 joules in the energizer, and it should be able to run the electricity through your wires at a voltage of at least 6,000 volts. Um, we got this one because our previous energizer was an S20. It only had 0.2 volts, this, uh, 0.2 joules. This one has 0.4. We haven't had a bear in our yard since, so I thought this would be adequate. Um, I'm going to keep it for now, but I think next season I'm probably going to upgrade to a more powerful energizer. We're near the end of the season here. I think this will probably get the job done, but I'd prefer not to take any chances going forward. So I, I want to get one that's properly sized. Um, one of the reasons you might consider getting a less powerful one is cost. The more powerful they are, the more expensive they are. Um, the other thing about the cost of these, this is a solar charged panel. Uh, energizer. This solar panel will provide a trickle charge to a 12 volt battery that's in the back encasement here. The reason we went with that is because of the distance from where our electrical outlets are to the bee yard. If your bee yard is close to your house or a barn or another place where you can connect to the power grid, the energizer you get would be one that goes indoors, under, or in some kind of protective cover from the elements, and is probably about half the price of one of these solar chargers. Um, third option is an energizer powered by an external DC battery. In the case of those, you still need a way to recharge that battery periodically, and you might even need a second battery to swap out while you recharge the battery. On-off switch here. This, on this, uh, this particular energizer, that simply tells you the battery is charged, goes off, and then I have two settings here. If you do look at the Gallagher units. They have a setting for livestock because a lot of these are designed for farmers who want to keep their livestock within a field. If it's on the livestock setting, the pulse that this sends out will be less at night when the animals are less active. So you'd want this on the wildlife setting where the pulse is a fast one day and night. These chargers, as I mentioned, send a pulse through the wire. So it's not a constant stream of electricity. So if you grab the wire You'll get a shock, but you'll be able to pull your hand off and get away from it. If it had a constant, continuous flow of electricity, you might be like a cartoon character, grab the wire and not be able to let go. You don't want that to happen. You want one that does not provide continuous charge, gives a pulse charge. 
and that's what most of them do. This is a ground rod. It's connected to the charger by a wire from this ground clamp here. Now, this ground rod really should be in the earth about six to eight feet. I couldn't get this one in when I set up the first fence because we have very rocky soil. I hit a rock and apparently I hit it so hard I had real trouble getting this out. So I just left it. I added a second ground rod, which is connected to this first one uh, with an underground wire. That wire is insulated because it runs underground. And even that didn't get me enough voltage to the fence. So I installed a third ground rod that's hidden under that box in front of the beehives over there. Um, they connect one to the other, and once I had three ground rods in, I got enough voltage in the wires. Three ground rods is apparently not an unusual number in a lot of circumstances. You'll have to test it as you go. This is the back of this charger. This is where the battery is housed. You can open it with a screwdriver right here and see the battery connection. This red and a little lightning bolt on there, I don't know if you can see it, indicates that's the connection for the hot wire. The green is the connection to the ground. This wire runs back down to that ground rod I showed you. The red wire connection runs here, and in our case, we connected it to this switch. This way I can turn, that's the on position. I've had it off so I don't shock myself. Wouldn't be the first time. Um, this way I can turn this on and off from outside the bee yard. I don't have to reach in to the energizer. And then this switch is connected to the top line and then they're daisy chained all the way down. So basically this fence right now has all hot wires. So the way the electric fence works is when a bear comes along or I come along and I grab one of these wires, fortunately it's off, um, my feet on the ground, I complete a circuit that goes from the charger, through the wire, through me, through the ground, and back up to the charger. That completion of the circuit gives me a shock. That's one reason why the ground rods are the second most important component of your fence after the energizer. I'm also going to put a link down below to an animated video from Zariba Systems. Zariba, I think that's the correct pronunciation, is one of the largest electric fence manufacturers in the country. Um, they've got a nice animated video that kind of shows how this works so you can understand a little better. When we decided to put in a permanent fence, we decided to put in wooden fence posts, mainly because it pretty close to our garden and while these fence posts are not cedar like the ones in the garden they match up a little bit better so it's more an aesthetic thing um, we could have done these and you might see a lot of bee fences done with the t-post like we have the charger sitting on common option for a fence post is a metal t-post so named because the top kind of forms the shape of a t up there um, this one is pretty heavy duty they have this section at the bottom that if you have very soft soil, you could probably step on this and push it into the ground. Uh, I've had to go through a rubber sole of a boot trying that here in our soil though. The best way to get these in the ground is with a post driver, which is a device that just slips over the top with a couple of handles. You can pound it in. You could use a mallet or a sledgehammer, but if you see this, the height of it relative to me, for example, very difficult for me to get up there with any leverage. So post driver is your best option. Or you could just dig a hole and put it in and fill the hole in like you would with a wood post. Um, you could work with these. You could use these in conjunction with the wooden posts. Or you can use fiberglass posts, which are kind of step-in posts. This is a plastic, what's known as a step-in post. It has a little spot where you push your foot down on to drive this in. This stands about 38 inches high once it's pushed into the ground. Oops. I consider these step-in posts to be more for a temporary fence than a permanent one. They pull out pretty easily. You can relocate it. It's not going to stand up to a lot of pushing. I've actually had some of these snap off in very strong windstorms. So probably not the sturdiest choice, but if you want to get something up quickly and you want it to be temporary because you're not sure where you're going to end up with your permanent fence, it could be a good option for you to choose. One thing to consider if you opt for 
wooden fence posts. Um, is these really need should be set into the ground as reasonably deep as you can get them, maybe three or four feet, depending on the frost line in your area. Uh, as I mentioned, or may have mentioned, we have really rocky soil here. Very difficult to dig a fence post hole with a um, post hole digger, manual post hole digger. We had to get a power auger that we were able to attach to a tractor. Made it a lot easier. Um, depending on where you live, you might have an easy time getting these put in. We also put in some gravel at the bottom for drainage and then some concrete to hold them stable. Um, this one is not in concrete, so this one wobbles. After I did that, I decided to put them all in concrete. If you use wooden posts or metal posts, you're going to need insulators. These are plastic insulators here that the wires run through. The purpose of the insulators is to keep this wire from touching the post, because if it touches the post, it will be grounded, just like the bear is. If the wire is grounded, you won't get a shock from it. So the only way you can do this without these types of insulators is if you have a plastic fence post. Um, these come in various sizes. They're typically black or yellow. Um, I opted for these. They have a little pin that keeps the wire in place, and they also have a screw placed at the top and the bottom, which I felt was a little more secure. But there are ones that are held with a single nail. There are also some that come out several inches. Um, because I was using these, I had to put two at each wire location on the corner post to get it to wrap around without touching the post. Um, these are all things to consider in the uh, in your planning stage. You have several choices of wire. You can use high tensile steel, which also can be tensioned to a level that functions as a physical bar barrier in addition to the psychological barrier of the electric shock. Um, you use steel wire. We opted for 14 gauge aluminum. There are also some poly wires, which is plastic interwoven with metal strands. You can get poly wire, which is similar in diameter to something like this aluminum wire, or you can get poly rope. This is a plastic wire that's interwoven with some metal strands. You might actually be able to see the metal shining in the sunlight here. This is very light, very easy to work with. Um, if you use this, you're probably going to need a tensioner like this to tighten the line. Just run it through the middle there and use the handle to tighten it up. And then you would need these stainless steel connectors where you run the wires underneath the flat plate here and you use the bolts to hold it down so your wires are connected. Very simple, very easy to use. It's what we had on our Gallagher Smart Fence, which we had set up a number of years ago and it seemed to get the job done. Um, there's also an item called poly tape, which from what I've seen is used mainly for uh, horse farming. Uh, it's like a ribbon that has metal through it. It's highly visible. Um, poly wire and poly rope are much more visible than these electric lines also. Might be something to consider. Poly wire and poly rope are pretty easy to work with. Um, like I said, we opted for the aluminum wire. I think it's a little more long-lasting than the poly wire, um, but that's a personal choice and a pricing consideration. When you do your fence layout, don't forget you're going to need a way to get in and out. So you're going to have to look at gate handles and possibly a different type of insulator at the gate location. Um, there are gate handles that are attached to uh, springs. I just connected it using the regular wire. Um, take a look at it. The ones that the springs are a little bit more expensive than just using a little wire, but they also make it easier to hang it up and when you're not using it. Another item you'll need is a fence tester to check the voltage on your line, which I'll talk about later. And then there are optional items like joint clamps and the cutout switch I mentioned earlier. So there's a number of steps you should go through in setting up your electric fence. First one is to plan it. Um, if you're starting out as a beekeeper, you already need to think about where you're going to put your beehives. If you think you want to fence it in with electric fence, you should factor that into the equation. Um, you might want to keep it further away from the house if you have kids or you have a dog. Our dog got zapped by our fence, has never been near, near the bee since. Um, 
Okay, we've got another sudden costume change here. Um, I had this video all edited and uploaded to YouTube when I realized I left out a, a very important item. Later on in this video, I'm going to talk about putting ground rods in six to eight feet, which I talked about earlier, and about putting in fence posts. When planning the location for your electric fence, you want to pick a spot where those ground rods will be at least 50 feet away from any other grounded utilities, your electrical for your house, telephone utilities, and also away from any buried metal water pipes. You don't want to have any stray voltage leaking into the water pipes. You don't want to have any interference between the other grounded utilities, etc. Very important to consider that in your location. The other thing with putting 30 feet, six to eight feet in the ground, like the rods, or digging deep for posts, uh, like wood posts may go in three or four feet, you want to make sure that where you're digging, you're not going to hit any buried utilities or lines. There are probably resources in your community, maybe your local utility you could talk to. We also found a website, call811.com, I'll put a link in the description below, where you can find out resources in your local area to help you figure out where you've got underground, underground lines. If you hit an underground line with an auger like we use for, to do our wood posts, best case scenario, you'll sever a line, have a service disruption, maybe have an expensive repair bill. Worst case scenario, you could incur a serious injury. You don't want to do that. Make sure you know the proper location before you start pounding in your round rods and digging for post holes. Now I'll get back to my other costume. Planning also comes into the size of the bee yard. One of the reasons we did a temporary one in our second year is because we weren't sure how, how large our bee yard might get. Um, now that we've been doing it as long as we, as long as we have, we're thinking of getting more and more hives, making this a much bigger apiary. So we expanded from what the size was of our temporary yard. Since we already had a fence set up, our initial planning was relatively simple. We weren't going to, we weren't going to move the bee yard. It was just a matter of laying out a string line outside the perimeter of our existing fence to show the expanded bee yard we wanted to set up and then calculating how much material we were going to need to put up a fence of that size. As I mentioned, the solar energizer is a lot more expensive than the regular AC plug-in energizer. Uh, the energizer will probably be the single most expensive component of your electric fence if you're building it for a bee yard. It might be different if you were fencing in a large pasture, but for a bee yard of this size, this is about 30 by 40, you might want a smaller one, especially if you're just starting out with a couple of hives. Um, that energizer, this energizer ran over $200. Um, there are solar panels, solar energizers that run over 300. You can get plug-in ones for probably half of that price. Um, after the cost of the energizer, everything's pretty much variable depending upon the size of your yard. So once you plan it and lay it out and figure out the perimeter, how many feet you have is going to determine how many fence posts you need, how many wires, how many lines you want to put up. In this case, I have six. You might want to have four or five. Um, I think five is the minimum recommended, but you might want to do four. Um, the length of your fence, the number of lines you put up will determine how many feet of wire you use, how many fence posts you have will determine how many of these insulators you might use. The other cost that'll be a little bit variable, whether you pick wooden fence posts or metal fence posts. In terms of figuring out the estimated cost, I'm going to put a link below to our website where we've got an article that lays all this out and also has a connection to a calculator. It's going to give you a rough estimate based upon some information you put in driven by the size of the yard you're planning and what kind of energizer you want to use. For a small yard with a less expensive energizer, might even be a little underpowered, um, you're probably talking somewhere around $200 to $300 to put up a yard. Uh, electric fence. Uh, I think we spent somewhere around 550 here. I haven't added up all the numbers yet. I do have a couple of things I still need to finish here and check on. So that might give you a range of what to look at, but take, take a look at the link in the description below and that might help you out a little bit. When weighing the cost of putting the electric fence in, you have to weigh it against the cost of having your bee yard destroyed by a bear. Uh, as I mentioned, our first one, we lost the bees. So 
maybe 150 bucks and the loss of a season. If you grow your bee yard to where you have six, eight, ten beehives and all of them get destroyed, which is quite possible in a bear attack, think of the cost of that compared to the cost of the fence. Plus, we got lucky. All we lost were the bees and some frames. The bear could have ripped apart the box, damaged the hive in a lot more ways. Um, the bear did do other damage around here, ripped a couple of birdhouses open. Uh, we had a bear rip, it open, rip open a trash enclosure. So there is other damage that could occur, but I'm keeping to the cost of the bee yard right now. Once you've come up with your plan and know where you're going to put your fence and you know the size of it, you can order all your parts and then you should go lay out where your fence is. Now, if your fence is pretty small, you could probably just pick spots, put up your post, and go from there. When we did this fence, because of the size of it, we actually laid out a string line. We picked locations in the corners, ran string around, and then measured off each corner to try and get it as square as possible. To get the corners square, you need to apply Pythagorean's theorem. To get the corners square, to get the corner square, you make use of Pythagorean's theorem for right angle triangles. Yep, that's what I said. Um, make it simple. You measure three feet along one of your lines. You measure four feet along the perpendicular line. And the line that connects the ends of those two should be five feet, which makes your corner square or 90 degrees. We did that on our fence. It's not perfect, but we got it pretty close. I'll put a link in the description below to a link, I believe it's from Lowe's, that tells you how to lay out a string line to get your corner square if you're doing a larger fence. Once you have your string line laid out, you can measure off the spacing between your post, mark it, and then your string line can go away. After that, you can dig whatever holes you need, whatever you need to do to place your fence posts in those locations. Once the fence posts are up, you can add your insulators to them. What I did was I took a piece of wood and marked out the spacing on the wire lines on that piece of wood and then transferred it over to the fence post so that I could just go in and screw in insulators one at a time and just work my way around the yard. For our fence, I use six lines with a maximum height, the top line being at 42 inches. Your top line should probably be no lower than 40 inches. Five lines is a good number. Your bottom line should probably be no, no less than six, maybe eight inches from the ground. The reason for that is to try and keep the bear from trying to get underneath that wire, digging under it. They can dig, they can climb. If it's enough of an attractant, the bear will try and figure it out. I'll put a link in the description below to the Zariba page where they lay out fence spacing for different types of electrical fence uses. The last two on their chart are for predators, and those are the ones that will show you five and six lines with spacing up to 40 and 42 inches. I suggest you take a look at that. You need to set up your energizer. If you're doing an AC plug-in one, you need to find a protected location, set it up close to an outlet, then run some wires to your ground and also wires that you'll eventually connect to the hotline. In our case, using a solar energizer, we put in a T-post near one of our wood posts so that we could connect easily to the cutout switch. Once your energizer is set up, you can pound in your ground rods. The first ground rod should be close to the energizer for an easy connection. There are some things I've seen that say it has to be within 20 feet. There's no reason why you couldn't put it right near the energizer. And then if you're going to do additional ground rods, space them about 10 feet apart. Um, I strongly suggest you consider that. You might want to put in one ground rod, see how it works, and then go from there. One way to add grounding to your fence is to alternate the hot wires with ground wires. Your bottom wire and top wire should be hot, but alternating in between you can connect the bottom wire to the ground and then connect all your ground wires to each other. In that way, if the bear touches a hot and a ground that are close together, uh, the bear will get a shock. I may actually change this setup a little bit from all hot wires to that because during the winter time when we get a lot of snow on the ground, the ground, frozen ground may not be a good conductor to get a, get a charge.
In setting up the insulators, we used a what's called a gate anchor at the gate entrance. On the posts on either side of the gate, there are different type of insulator lets you terminate the wires at that point and then put a gate to connect those two. Right, because we had the gate anchors, we started at one gate anchor, worked our wiring around the fence until we came to the opposite gate anchor and tied it off and then went to the next line. Didn't take long at all. I think we probably did the six lines in less than half an hour. To connect your wire to the gate anchor, if you use one like we did, we found the easiest way was just to tie a knot in the wire. Um, I'll show a video here where I'm tying a knot. Not the greatest wire knot you've ever seen. I'm also going to put a link in the description below to a YouTube video um, from Tim Thompson in Australia. He does a lot of fencing videos that are really informative. He'll show you the proper way to tie off a fence knot. Trust me, whatever I did here is not the best, but it got the job done. I also tied a fence knot onto the gate handle at the other end for the connection to the two anchors. After you have all your wiring done, you can connect your energizer. Connect the ground, as I showed earlier, from your ground rod to your grounding post on the energizer. And then you can connect from the hot post on the energizer to your first wire. We connected our generator's hot post to the top wire via the cutoff switch. The wire from the cutoff switch connects with a joint clamp. All the way down the line, we connected one wire to another using joint clamps. The joint clamps are very easy to use. You could use wire crimps. You could just tie wires together. I like using the joint clamps. It'll make it easy to remove these if I want to make any changes. For example, if I want to change from all hot wires to alternating hot and ground. I, re I recommend taking a look at the joint clamps as a way to connect your wires. Once your energizer is connected, close up the gate to create a continuous loop of wires around the fence. Turn the energizer on. You can't test it unless it's on. I've made that mistake. Uh, then take your fence tester and measure the voltage. Our fence tester gives a rather precise reading of the voltage. Um, it's a digital one. You can also get one that just gives you a red light that tells you the approximate voltage, 6,000, 7,000, uh, along those lines. The tester will probably have a rod that sticks into the ground and then a place to touch to the electric fence and give you your reading. If you're not getting at least 6,000 volts, check, do a little troubleshooting. You might want to check and see all your connections are good, see if you've got any vegetation that's grown, grown up along your bottom line where it's touching anything, make sure your insulators are working properly, um, make sure your fence tester's on, and just check all that, and you'll probably find no problem if you've done all that. If all your connections are good, then the problem may be in your grounding. You should disconnect the energizer and test the post on the back with your fence tester the same way you do the fence. You put uh, the grounding one, grounding rod to the ground section and the other one to the hot wire and see if the energizer is giving you at least 6,000 volts. If that's not happening, then you may need to talk to the manufacturer and find out what's going on. Maybe your battery's not charged, um, but you'll need to check the energizer. If the energizer is working properly, then your ground system may not be enough. If you only put in one ground rod, this is the time to consider adding a second, maybe a third ground rod, and hopefully that'll fix the problem. Or you may want to alternate the hot and ground wires on your fence line in order to get a proper grounding. Once your fence is installed and you've got the proper charge running through it, a lot of people recommend baiting your fence for the bear. Uh, what you want to do is create a situation where the bear will be enticed to touch the fence with its nose or its tongue and get the shock. It's a learning experience. Uh, the way to bait it would be to drape some strips of bacon in a couple of spots around the fence on the wire. That's about where you would think nose height might be for the bear. Or you could put some peanut butter on aluminum foil and attach that to the fence. Um, 
one shock might be all it takes. If that doesn't, the bear comes back. A second shot might, a second shock might do the trick. We didn't bait our fence. It, it seemed to work without that. I would suggest if you bait your fence, you might want to consider baiting it at the each spring, only because you might have a different bear in your area. Um, we've had bears come through here and been reported around the community, and then it eventually gets hit by a car, and then we don't see a bear for a while. And then maybe two years later, a bear shows up again. And it's a pretty good bet it's a different bear. Bears are fairly territorial. So while you may chase off one bear with a shock on the fence, um, after a couple of years, you might have a different bear showing up. And so if you're into the baiting, you might want to do it periodically. When we first decided we were going to put in a permanent electric fence, we thought about hiring somebody to do it for us. Um, we found there are two types of fence companies in our area. People that will install a fence, but not with electricity, and people would come and electrify an existing fence. And that's when we decided that this was probably a do-it-yourself project. There is nothing connected with this installation that's overly difficult or overly complicated. I would say while we spent we did this over the course of about a week. If you were to dedicate your time, you could probably do this in two days by yourself. Uh, for a much smaller fence, it's a one-day project. It wasn't all that difficult. Other than the auger, we needed no real funky tools. A drill to put these screws in, uh, a wire cutter, screwdriver. You could do, use a hammer if you're nailing these insulators in. Um, I don't... The only specialty tool that you should have anyway is a, a fence tester or a voltmeter um, because once you install this you could test if it's working by grabbing it with your hand but you won't really know how many volts are coming through it so the proper way to test it is with a fence tester get a reading on it and you should test it periodically to make sure it's working an electric fence is no guarantee that a bear won't get into your apiary fences fail batteries run out if you have a AC plug-in, you could have a power outage at the wrong time. You might have vegetation growing up along your bottom line. You haven't cleared out that drained your voltage. So you need to keep it maintained. It's not a guarantee, but it's probably the best way to keep a bear out of your yard. And besides things going wrong, there are simple things like forgetting to turn it back on when you leave it. I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover in this video. If you have any questions, you can ask them down in the comments below. I'll try and get answers to you. Um, if you like the video, I'd appreciate it if you give us a thumbs up. Consider hitting the notification bell so you know about future videos and subscribing to the channel. If you didn't like the video, you want to give us a thumbs down, that's okay too. But I would appreciate it if you tell us in the comments below what you didn't like about it. Try to give us some constructive criticism so that we could do a better job going forward and maybe provide a little more help to you in the future. Thanks again for watching. Don't forget to turn on your fence and we'll see you next time.